installment of the Business Day Digital, Legal Business Digital Conversations. Um, we're very happy to have you here with us. This um, is done in collaboration with the Nigerian Bar Association Section on Business Law, Employment, Labor and Industrial Relations Committee. Um, so we have our esteemed panelists here and Mr. Shini Adio SAN, the chairman of the NBA SBL, would be giving the introductory remarks and then we look forward to a thought-provoking and insightful um, discussion on this wonderful topic. So please stay tuned. Mr. Shini Adio, over to you, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, um, good afternoon uh, to our distinguished uh, panelists and uh, e-delegates. Uh, good afternoon to recognize uh, Mr. Alumidi Apata, our immediate past uh, chairman of the Nigerian Bar Association Section on Business Law. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Apata, you're welcome. Thank you for making, taking time to come and join us <laughs> in the middle of your campaign. So it's a pleasure to have you. So thank you for that kind consideration. Um, I also want to recognize the uh, chairman of the uh, Employment, uh, Labor and Industrial Relations Committee of the NBASBL, Mr. Ose Opeku, for uh, organizing this um, well thought out uh, webinar. Um, the Employment and Labor Committee of the SBL has been one of the most active uh, committees of the section. So, um, and that was the case uh, when it was under the leadership of uh, uh, Anthony Nwauche. Uh, so Tony, um, you know, uh, Ose has kept the flag flying, so to speak. Uh, so congratulations on that. We're very proud of your committee. Um, very innovative committee. So even this collaboration with Business Day is another innovation that uh, the committee has come up with. Um, so the topic for today, a decent work agenda, fair treatment and equal opportunities in the workplace. I mean, my own task is very easy uh, today, really. Um, I'm going to stay to participate, um, but um, you know, I'm not gonna take too much time so that we can have as much of an interaction with our delegates and also they can have enough time to hear from uh, the distinguished uh, panel that we have uh, this afternoon. Um, and then maybe we'll also talk about, um, you know, these issues uh, somewhat uh, on a global scale, including uh, some peculiar aspects of it, perhaps in, in other crimes. But it's an issue that is very, very pertinent at this point. And uh, particularly with the advent of the COVID, um, there are certain other additional considerations that I would submit employers need to take into consideration to make sure that uh, they create uh, a decent work environment uh, for employees um, so as to make uh, it such that they can work in a safe uh, in a safe environment. So without further ado, I thank you all. I thank you for the opportunity uh, to have been able to make this very brief uh, opening remarks. Uh, and again, I welcome our delegates. Uh, Mr. Apata, again, thank you for joining us uh, from your rather busy, busy schedule. Um, I, I, I don't know whether it was part of the, the, um, the agenda, but uh, since we have him, uh, who knows how long for, but hopefully for the entire duration of the, of the webinar, but perhaps uh, Mr. Pata may want to say uh, a few words. Uh, Mr. Pata. Uh, Mr. Chairman, sir, um, I think I have an opportunity to say a few words in the course of the session, but now that Chairman has given me a first bite at the cherry, and uh, promising me a second one shortly. Let me take advantage as a true politician to <laughs> say, uh, because I have become one now uh, <laughs> to say thank you. But firstly, uh, let me join you, Mr. Chairman. You know, you and I spoke this weekend about um, the work that our committees are doing, the work that our committees at the SBL are doing and have been doing and how proud we are of our committee. So let me just place it on record. Let me join you in commending um, Jose Opeko and his team. This is not the first time I'm, I'm appearing at an event this year organized by this committee. Um, and so uh, it's just amazing 
uh, that this is going on. Because as I said to you over the weekend, Mr. Chairman, uh, we go around the country saying SBL is, a, is working. SBL is a well-oiled machine. And sometimes you stop for a second and say, uh, I hope I hope us and co are actually working uh, so that they can, um, they can, they can not let anybody doubt or uh, circum uh, to, to, to doubt whatever I say about SBL. But time and time again, our committees continue to uh, confirm all that we say about SBL. Our council continues to confirm all that we say about SBL that, you know, that we have come to a point where SBL is working almost on autopilot. And let me be the first to congratulate you on, again, after the fact, on the conference we just held, our virtual conference. Amazing stuff. And then I see the committee doing this today in collaboration with Business Day. I'm proud to be a part of it. You're right, Mr. Chairman, it was really hard to tear, tear myself away from stuff that I'm doing at the moment. But because of my commitment to SBL, you know I would, I would find a way one way or the other. And um, I, I just want to encourage the committee that do not be weary in well-doing. Continue in what you are doing. People are watching. This is what I have learned in the course of my present pursuits. People are watching. People recognize and, and know value when they see it. So congratulations to the committee. And I look forward to a very uh, engaging and uh, a robust session this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Olu, and thank you, um, um, SAN, for setting the tone for what promises to be a very engaging um, um, session. Let me just introduce one of our other panelists, um, Mrs. Neka Idam, who happens to be the HR partner for ACCA Global in Africa and Emerging Markets. Um, SCCA happens to be one of the biggest professional bodies in the world, accounting body, and um, we're grateful to have her here with us as well. Also, let me recognize um, Chingwe, the Senior Commercial Legal Manager for Guinness. Chingwe, one way or the other, has always been involved in our activities and the activities of SBA, and so we're grateful that she's been able to join us today as well. So, setting the tone for the conversation we intend to have today, which is um, the ILO Decent Work Agenda, what truly is the decent work agenda? To truly understand decent work agenda, we must then start with what is decent work. ILO says decent work is productive work for men and women in conditions of freedom, equity, security, and dignity. So what the ILO has then done from 1999 when this agenda was set up was to have a programmatic policy to enshrine decent work at the national level, state level, sectoral, and organizational level. And this, um, the decent work agenda is based on four strategic pillars, which is fundamental principles of right at work, social dialogue, social protection, employment, and creation of enterprise. But after that, the stills into 10 principles, which are fair work in the environment, in the, in the, in the workplace, health and safety, psychological well-being, fair wages for work done, elimination of slave labor, and a host of other 10 principles. Now, when it comes to social protection, the COVID-19 has, as I would say, exposed our underbelly in the sense that we, we lack I would like what I would call structured social protection. So in Nigeria, for instance, palliative were probably done by churches and other organizations, and there was no structured palliative for government to reach out to those who really needed it. Now, our health sector has been found wanting. There was no provision of some form of benefit for workers who lost their jobs. So in the UK, for instance, you had to follow leave where you were guaranteed a certain amount of payment even if you lost your job, even if you didn't have a job. And so these are some of the issues that we've seen. And then, and in the course of this, I just did a small research, not, not, not too heavy, and it was interesting what came out of it. And I'll share the statistics with you. Of 20 PLCs that we looked through in Nigeria, you had 206 directors. Only 45 of those were women, which represent about 21%. Now, we looked at 20 law firms again. 
in Lagos. And this might be skewed a bit because if the further down you go outside Lagos, you might find out that this skews the picture a bit. Um, there were 169 partners. Of those, 57 were female, which is about 33%, not too different from what you had in the PLCs. So these are issues around equality. And then sometimes I look at, it, I look at an advert for jobs and I see the age criteria and I'm thinking, what has age got to do with the role? Truly, is it not about the output? Is it about the age or the output? And then last year, 2019, I was lucky to moderate a session on Me Too, sexual harassment. And what came out of that was that we actually have an endemic sexual harassment culture in the legal profession. Following the research carried out by IBA and that of the United Nations. And so these are issues around a decent work agenda. And so just to set the tone for that, and, and um, we'll have been discussing all of this. So I know that in protocol, you probably speak to the SAN first, but because we're looking at equality here, and we have some women on the, on the panel, I'll rather I'll start with um, NECA, and I'll say NECA, truly, what really, in terms of breaking it down, and, and I always like to say this, to break it down to, to the bare knuckles, really, what truly is this work agenda? What does that translate in practical terms for ACCA? Thank you, Jose. Good afternoon, fellow panelists. And let me also thank the uh, NBA's SBL and Business Day for this opportunity. So I think the best thing to do is to illustrate with an example of what has happened at ACC. I think that pretty much will bring all of this together. So we completed our restructure about two years ago. And I had a colleague approach me. She wanted a one-to-one -one discussion. And her view was that she now looks after two countries instead of the one. And she was wondering why she didn't get a, a raise, a salary increase with this broadened scope. And I said to her, well, is that making you consider other options outside ACCA? And she said, oh, no, no, no. She just wanted to understand why. So I went on to explain to her why that decision was taken and the fact that it was consistent with other such changes across the globe. So it wasn't peculiar to her. She looked at me quite pensively for a bit. And then I said, well, again, if you want to have another conversation around considering your options, we could have that conversation. Remember, I'm HR, so we do have these conversations. It's all part of our day job. And um, she then went on to explain to me that, look, I've got peers in Mecca. I've got friends outside. I know I've got a good here. And I thought, oh, okay. What do you mean when you say you've got a good here? Talk to me about that. She said, well, I've been with, with this organization about seven years now. And when I joined, I joined as a temp, a support front desk person. And in that time, up to now, I've had two kids. I've had lots of opportunities for progression. Like I said, starting out as a temp, now I'm looking after a function, and now I'm looking you know, after two countries. In that time, I've had the opportunity to travel to several other countries. I participate in sessions where I'm able to contribute unfettered at a national, at a regional, and at a global level. I'm recognized for the contributions that I make. And when I think about it, yes, it is a lot of hard work. But when I think that I can work two days from home, I think that I can then also, for the other days that I work in the office, have compressed hours so I can finish at three for the long commute home. Neka, that's a lot. So it may not be translating to a lot of money in the bank, but I can't pay for all of that. And so long story short, she said to me, Neka, it's okay. I enjoy the work I do and that's a primary thing. Now, in ACCA, fairness is crucial. That is the essence of our history, access, that people can join an organization, that we preach that to our accountants as well as part of the professional qualification, and that 
we as a body are regulating the fairness in the practice of the technical qualifications that people are administering on a day-to-day -day basis. We have to leave that in our organization. Now, if you were to take this then out to say, what does this mean for Nigeria as a whole? We've got a population that is what, about 23, 23%, I believe. We've got about 23% um, that is, well, depending on who you talk to, that number could actually change that is unemployed. And because of that high unemployment rate, you do have a number of people who face a lot of indignities because they're trying to get access to work. If you recognize some or any of what I described in that incident with my colleague, it's because you're probably in a decent job. You're experiencing what, or say you've just described as decent work with all of the you know, pillars represented there. But there are people who are not experiencing that. We have modern slavery in our environment today. People who are working well below the minimum wage. And because of that, we then have a cyclical poverty because they are low, they're, they're low income earners. You then have their children probably having to work to augment you know, the family income. We see our hawkers, we see our beggars, we see those who are probably in rural areas as farmers, you know, all having to augment you know, family income. What access will they have to education? How will they then improve their own personal circumstances? And then if we were to ramp this up, what will this mean for our economy as a whole, given the percentages that we're talking about? It is significant. It is significant, and I'm really glad that we're talking about this today, because as a people, in our respective functions, we do have the duty, a moral duty, looking at the social justice angle of it, we have a duty to contribute as best we can to address this. So what is ACCA doing, you probably ask me. Now, our purpose as an organization is to be a force for public good. In all of the countries where we work, we have the opportunity to engage with professional bodies, national bodies, um, governments, public sector representatives, private sector. And so we use these engagements and not looking at our stakeholder our ecosystem, which includes stakeholders like learning partners, universities, employers, working with all of these people, we look to influence change, to, to guide policy, and in some instances as well, actually work with national governments to ensure that some of the practices that actually make decent work a challenge, we talk about corruption and corrupt practices in Africa, given the leeway we have with our profession is actually addressed from, from the source. And that's where all of the frameworks are put in place around good accounting practices begin to come in. So we're talking about real change, meaningful change using what we have. And that is good, solid technical knowledge and then driving that through with our professional insights. It's a long journey, I have to say. But the most important thing is that we have started, and I expect again that there will be a number of other organizations and bodies like yourselves that are contributing to this um, promotion of decent work agenda. Back to you, Jose. Thank you very much. Um, thank, thank, thank you, thank you quite, um, for that very incisive um, um, contribution, Neka. Um, Jimwe, I will move over to you now. Um, you've worked in what can be called a male-dominated environment, right? manufacturing uh, and um, would you say you've been afforded fair treatment in the course of your career from NBC to Guinness and even worked in a law firm you know would you say you've been afforded fair treatment and you compared to a comparator a male comparator like yourself doing the same task do you think you were given the opportunity to progress just like your male counterpart Okay, so thank you, Oste, for the question. But let me also join NECA in thanking um, NBA SBL for the opportunity to be part of this panel. So you're doing a great job, Oste, with the committee. I also thank Business Day Law because um, in this new normal, it's very important to have these conversations. You know, it also helps with mental well-being. Honestly, to have these conversations 
get clarity on what the law says and you know just generally hear from people's experiences so to your question have i been given fair treatment so i would answer it in two ways the basic answer is yes i have not at any point in my career felt like i've been unfairly treated as a woman or as a lawyer okay so going in-house into manufacturing of course you know that the lawyers are in the minority generally because they're there to support you know the core commercial so i would say personal experience my answer is yes i've been treated okay fairly but then the question is um there's the difference between creating the fair playing environment and a person getting fair treatment because sometimes what we may call fair treatment from a personal point of view might actually be you getting what you need to get based on your personal um the value you bring to the table your personality your qualifications and just your way of working so i would say yes i've been given fair treatment um but also i'll look at it from a general point of view in having conversations with people you know looking at colleagues whether in the companies i work for or not um, there have been different experiences, okay? So let me just, you know, give a, a, a disclaimer. I'm here speaking in my personal opinion. I'm not here to speak on behalf of um, any organization, and you understand that. But I will still speak from experience. So in, in the thing about fair treatment, okay, let's go back to um, law firm work. My core practice was litigation, arbitration, and ADR. And you know that litigation in Nigeria for a very top law firm would involve a lot of travel, a lot of what you would call hustling and, you know, a lot of tough work. The presumption, you know, with some... Oh, I, I think technical hitch is there and that's, that's part of the challenges with working remotely as well. Um, I think Chiwe will come back to us at some point. We lost her there. Um, why we wait for Chiwe? Tony, I'll just go over to you so that there's no, there's no break. Um, Tony, part of a decent work agenda means decent pay, right? And, and you are the managing partner of TLC as well as the Lagos Bar Association Committee on Remuneration. Do you think that lawyers receive decent wages? And how would you determine what's a decent wage? Um, I'll say thank you. And let me thank the SBL and Business Day for this opportunity. Speaking about equality, also, I'll say that um, I thought you let one woman and then one man speak and then one woman and then one man. <laughs> so it appears you've been, you've been unfair to me in this regard, but that by, <laughs> that by the way. Um, I think for me, generally, let's look at Nigeria as a whole because we can't look at lawyers um, in isolation. <laughs> We're in a country where I think we all know that some earn a decent wage, a lot do not. And so let's, well, let's come back to the legal profession. The first thing for me is that I think we should look at it in terms of the ILO's objectives, um, which is saying, one, that organizations should promote a, um, all workers getting a just share of the fruits of progress. That's in one hand. And then secondly, a living wage. So workers should generally get a just share of the fruits of progress and then a living wage. Now, when we talk about the just share of the fruits of progress, what we're saying basically is that what is the mindset of the employers or the owners of a business? I think it should be that everybody who is a stakeholder should actually get a just share of the fruits of progress. And let's be honest. Over time, work and the work situation has gradually progressed and improved. But in doing so, has every worker gotten a just share? If we take it from that mindset and understand that everybody here is a stakeholder and without everybody being carried along and feeling that they get a just share, ultimately it will affect our own ability as an organization to thrive and do what we set out to do. So, I think for a large extent, I, we need to think along that line. I think if we take that out of the equation, we can come to the second question and make that second one easier. Because the issue is, do a lot of us actually think from that perspective? Do we understand that our workers, our employees, our stakeholders, and have a share in it? 
And there are so many ways that's done. We, we see organizations who wake up today and ask and say, look, we want um, employees to have part of the share. We have a trust scheme. Some organizations have bonuses. We have so many things we're doing, but it must come from that perception and that notion, first of all, that everybody's a stakeholder and everybody should get a just share in the fruits of the progress. Now to the living wage, when we talk about living wage, we know we talk about um, any something decent, transportation, housing, healthcare, and all the like. Now, that's very important, but um, you must agree that you cannot look at that in a vacuum. It's tied to a country's economic progression, whether you like it or not. So that's there. Um, the committee is putting its heads together. The NBA is conscious of it, but I, I, we must be careful about how we go about it for two reasons. One, first of all, there's no legislation generally about minimum wage for lawyers in particular. We don't have any legislation. Um, so when you're talking of a living wage or a minimum wage, we, only, we can only start from what we have as a national minimum wage that applies to all categories of workers. Um, that's the, from where we are. But we, what we want to do is look at what are the basic minimum legal requirements that any organization, whether you're a law firm, whether you're a company, whether you're an accounting firm, whether you're in manufacturing, whether you're the ACCA, whatever, whatever you are, what are the basic minimum requirements? Are law firms actually meeting them first of all? Now, if we tackle that out, we can now look at the other issues that come into play. And there are several of them. And I'll give you um, an example. When you look at the legal profession historically, you will know that, um, particularly in our own jurisdiction, we started off in a situation where the lawyers at that time saw um, the, the new weeks more as pupils. They were undergoing a pupillate. Some of them actually paid their seniors to actually be employed and to work and to learn under them. They never really saw them as stakeholders in the real sense. They simply saw them as people who came under for a pupillage to work for a few couple, couple of years or months and then to move on to do their own. They never built what we know as partnerships in the real sense today or, or big commercial firms or institutions where people could hope to build a career and eventually part own. The idea at that time was you'd, you'd, once you finish law school, you'd come in, learn under a senior, who at that time felt he was doing you a favor. He didn't think you were adding any value. But society has evolved over time. We all know that in order to thrive as a business and as a law firm today, you must actually make your employees stakeholders. You have ownership in the business and that trade you apply together. So that has had to evolve. And, and that's why I think we have a situation where we need to move from that mindset that makes us think that these are not stakeholders. Um, once the pot comes, as the owners of the business, we take it and, uh, and then we move ahead. So for me, it's, it's a delicate balance. There are the economic issues that we cannot remove entirely. And that's why um, I must commend the SBL because I'll, I'll give you a few statistics you need to look about and, and to put this in context. What I'm talking about the ability of law firms to earn income and generate money and then to pay their workers. And I'll give you some simple ones. I, I took my time this morning to bring them out. The law school in Nigeria in 2018 and 2019 produced 4,779 students and 4,458 respectively lawyers. The New York Bar did 7,518, California Bar 4,566. The population of New York is 19 million, 19.45 million. California just under 40 million. Nigeria, 200 million. So in the real sense, if I look at it by the number of lawyers to the people, Nigeria is doing fairly well in that sense, in the sense that you would say there are not too many lawyers. But I'll come to the crux of it, which is economic activity. Now, I'll take the GDP of just New York. New York State in 2019 had had a GDP of 1.75 trillion US dollars. California had 3.2 trillion US dollars. Nigeria had 446 billion US dollars. Now, when you look at that together, what, what's it saying? Is that the economic activity 
for the first time on 779 lawyers is so is, is insignificant when you compare to what just New York or California generates. So what has the SBL been saying for a while now? It's that the legal profession must go outside its conventional ways of, of doing business and working. What are other areas we can look up to? And that's why if you look at the SBL, what, what's done under um, Shania Diona, who is here, and even Olu's time, was to think up of new areas of law to create opportunities for lawyers. So one, if you don't create opportunities and you don't have money, you can't pay, right? But secondly, when you do create the opportunities and when you actually have the money, what are we doing right? I'm not, I don't think we can say legislation because we don't. And I tell a lot of lawyers, I say, well, how come the other professions are not legislating? I think it has to do with the perception and the mindset that the people who are in those professions have. If you look at your profession like a business that has stakeholders and you need your stakeholders to actually take a part of the cake, I think it would work entirely different and it would benefit the whole um, gamut of the profession, whether you're in-house, whether you're, you're a litigator or whether you're running a full service law firm. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, that's, that's some fresh perspective you brought onto the table as well. And I, I, would, I, would, I would drill that further down um, in the next line of questioning. So, um, Olu, this is for you. Um, over time, I know you're campaigning for the president of the MBA, and you built your campaign on an all-inclusive bar. So, my question would be, based on what Tony has said, and Neka and Chingwe have all chipped in, how do you intend to achieve an all-inclusive bar that is fair and promotes equal opportunity at every level? Thanks, Jose. And thank you to all those who have spoken. Very, very interesting perspectives so far. Um, but um, I, I think, uh, yes, we are running, we are all in, well, some of us are contesting for office uh, uh, at the uh, Nigerian Bar Association, the upcoming elections. and. Um, the issues that we are discussing at the moment are definitely critical. And the NBA, uh, not just as, uh, as the umbrella body for lawyers, uh, but also as um, lawyers, lawyers also as employers of, uh, of, uh, of uh, labor, as it were. Uh, it's important for us to chime in into, into discussions of this nature and for us to get uh, a sense of the big picture. So yes, you are correct, Ose, uh, one of the things one of the issues that I brought to the table is that um, the NBA is unable to, to my mind, uh, uh, intervene in some of these issues because of the fact that um, not everybody is included in the conversation. Uh, and, and so you find that the women, uh, women lawyers who have their issues or the peculiar issues that confront them in the course of practicing their profession, for example, uh, to my mind, don't get as much of a say as they should in the, in the affairs of the association. Thankfully, we, this present administration just set up the NBA uh, Women's Forum or re-established it. Uh, to my mind, what is important is that each of these segments of the profession, uh, each, of the, each, of the, each of the groups that make up the legal profession in Nigeria must be given the opportunity to ventilate. Um, what you have presently is a group of people who sit down at the highest decision-making bodies of the association, body of the association, and uh, making rules and regulations and policy affecting all of us and without us having the opportunity to intervene in the process. So when I talk about an all-inclusive bar, I am asking and I am seeking to, for a situation, or seeking uh, to see a situation where um, at the level where decisions and policies are being made by this association, uh, Nigeria Bar Association, all the key stakeholders are involved. So that, um, again, K. Abiola said uh, uh, famously, uh, so that nobody gets to shave my head in my absence, if you know what I mean. So uh, um, um, just as, so the young lawyers, right, should be in the room to discuss to be able to discuss this, you statutorily be members of our national executive committee, uh, the women folk, uh, um, lawyers in the military, in-house counsel have their own issues that they think should be front burner. Um, um, 
Lawyers in Government Service, they are known as Lawyers and Law Officers Association of Nigeria. For me, that is the way we can run an all-inclusive bar. Uh, and, and, and so that is, the, that, is, that is how the conversation will start, so that we can um, um, put the issues at, on the front burner. Now, if you, now, once you have created a situation where everybody is at the table, then we can start drilling down to issues that affect us in the workplace. Some issues are general and they cut across all sectors. So the issue of uh, remuneration or, 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 or the issues of working environment. But if, for example, let us look at the issues that confront the women folk. Um, the NBA as an organization would need to pay attention to these issues because um, the reason why we, one of the reasons why we band together as an association is because we want the group to do for each of us what we cannot do for ourselves. That's the whole essence of coming together to derive some benefit. Otherwise, it will be pointless. It will be pointless. So um, when we now talk about, okay, what, what are the conditions uh, uh, in our profession regarding the women folk. Now, uh, does, this, uh, does this profession pay due attention to the peculiarities that actually are uh, inherent in being a woman lawyer? Uh, are we giving the women the opportunity to practice their profession proficiently, sustainably, and in a profitable manner? Are we, are, are women folk, and the members of our association, do they have equal opportunities starting from remuneration? Is it across board? Is it equal? Now, uh, uh, on the issue of, um, um, you know, that our women folk have their God-given responsibilities uh, outside of the workplace. Are we configuring our, 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 um, our, the way we organize our practices to take that into consideration? It goes beyond maternity leave. It goes beyond the uh, um, paying lip service to the issues. But we must, you know, uh, when, you know, you know, we must, you know, when a woman comes and, and says, I'm pregnant, and the first thing you hear from her boss is again, uh, and that, that by itself, that by itself is, a, is, a, is, is not good enough, you know? And, uh, and that shows you already some kind of stereotype and some kind of prejudice, because um, um, somebody, it would appear that some of us want the women to choose. You know, it's either you want a career or you want to be a mother or you want, you want a family. And that, that is not right. You're stacking the odds against the women for, but well, I'm not going to make this about the women. But the point I'm saying or trying to make is that uh, as a matter of philosophy, before we even go to policy, as a matter of philosophy, we must have an organization that recognizes that we must configure ourselves or we must organize ourselves in a way that takes into consideration the peculiarities of our members and their, 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 their distinct requirements. And it's not good enough to say um, we are only reflective of our society. Because as a profession, law, we are meant to be beacons in society. We are meant to lead the way, you know, and we're meant to show how things ought to be done. So I look forward to the day when the legal profession would actually chart the course and say this is gold, the gold standard for the way for, for equality at the workplace, for good working conditions. Uh, and then the rest of the country can begin to follow, follow uh, um, uh, take a cue. I had a really fantastic conversation with our colleagues, uh, lawyers with disability uh, yesterday. I had spent over one hour with them on the phone, just, just, just discussing uh, with them on their own issues. And it's unfortunate, and I'm sure you will all agree with me, that this particular society, our society, tends not to even remember that we have our compatriots, our colleagues who are, you know, confronted by these uh, by, uh, physical challenges. So because we don't remember, because we don't make the issue front burner, we don't even ensure that we are organized as a profession in such a way that they can practice the profession without undue difficulty. So, so uh, disability access is even something that we still have to ask for or discuss. Uh, um, uh, we, do we remember that some of our blind colleagues need assistance with regard to uh, tra tra uh, transcribing uh, documents into Braille? Or do we remember 
that um, sign language may be necessary at, in the courts or at any other fora where uh, lawyers participate uh, or, 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 or uh, uh, operate. So for me, yes, first thing, the first uh, reality check is that we, are, we live in a society that really does not recognize or has not paid heed or uh, uh, taken into consideration some of the requirements uh, of, our, of uh, different members of our, organize, uh, of our profession. Then, but I think it's also, it's doubly, it's, um, it's unforgivable that even as lawyers, you know, we are normally, we should be champions in society, championing the causes of others, that we are also guilty. And so I, when I say an all-inclusive bar, that is exactly what I mean, that we will take into consideration the requirements of all. And the requirements of all include what they need to practice their profession uh, uh, optimally. So I refer to the women folk, I refer to our colleagues with disability, I refer to the young lawyers uh, who, as many of you know, are my, uh, my abiding passion as far as, um, as far as this profession is concerned. So um, also in, in answering your question, uh, in a nutshell, firstly, it will be as a profession to bring, I, I don't have a silver bullet, right? Mm -hmm. But I have a proposition that we must create a platform where these issues are canvassed. So we remind ourselves, 2019 conference, which I co-chaired, what did we do? We said to ourselves, let's try and make a difference with this conference. So we said, it's difficult to navigate our conference, all right, for the elderly, which is another group, right, of our, of our, of our, of our association, the over 70s. So what did we do? We said to ourselves, let us show how the elderly in society ought to be treated. So to every participant at that conference, and I'm glad that, our chairman, Mr. Adieu, is back on. Uh, he will remember for every elderly or senior participant, we assigned an escort to that person, help them with registration, give them uh, uh, that escort to take them around the conference uh, arena and help them navigate what you and I would uh, uh, navigate what you would agree was a, could be a very challenging uh, uh, um, um, uh, venue or venues. So, and we also this worked on disability access for our, uh, our, our colleagues who are dis uh, physically challenged. And we, we tried to get them uh, secure seating or reserved seating. However, I don't think we did enough for our disabled uh, colleagues. And I'm hoping that the next conference that is physical will take this into consideration. Even the virtual conference should consider sign language and all of that for our, our, our colleagues. So also it's important to put these issues uh, uh, front and center, make them topics for discussion. And in the process, we will distill, we will synthesize all the shades of opinion. And as an organization, as a matter of philosophy, right? And then as a matter of policy, we will begin to take all of these issues and make them important. And make them important enough for us to say, this is what we do as a group. Uh, and I think um, that is the way my mind is working. And in the event that I'm successful in my present uh, pursuit and I find myself in a, at MBA house, you can be certain that this is how I would uh, uh, organize uh, uh, our association and uh, so that we can lead the way and, uh, and, and be the beacon that we should be in society. Thank you very much, Ulu. Um, Ulu is never short of um, brilliant ideas, so it um, doesn't come as a surprise at all with, the, with what you've laid out. Um, SAN, I know you, you said your, your task was the easy task of doing the introduction, but I'm sorry, I'll have, uh, you have to come in here at some point. Um, I was going to ask you, given your multi-jurisdictional exposure, would you say that Nigeria has adequate legislative interventions to engender a decent work agenda amongst its populace? You have to unmute yourself. Okay, thank you, Osi. Thank you for the question. Um, I think at the end of the day, at the end of the day, um, you know, people uh, implement all these rules. So it's nice to have the, the laws and the regulations, but at the end of the day is how well are they being implemented? I think broadly speaking that, you know, we have laws that address 
all the different issues that um, you know our panelists um, have discussed. And I was I was watching uh, during uh, the presentations the activities on the chat group and the, and the polling, and I noticed that um, um, surprisingly, perhaps given the issue we're talking about, it appears the majority of people uh, that are list haven't had bad experiences as employees. In fact, they wanted the question on the poll change from, um, you know, how often have you had a bad experience to perhaps okay. not applicable because many of them just haven't had it. Um, and I personally, um, as Chinwe had said, for example, I too, I guess I've been fortunate that I haven't really experienced, um, you know, uh, issues of discrimination or any kind of negativity uh, as far as in, in my, my, my work life. Now, and, have, and I'll get to some specifics, but having said that, having said that, um, I have to say that I was shocked to my marrow mm -hmm. when I first returned uh, back from the States. And um, the only time, well, except for one of the time very briefly, that I ever worked outside a law firm environment, you know, was when I was part of an executive management uh, when I first came back. And uh, in conducting a series of interviews, I observed that on the interview sheet, besides the names of the folks that were going to be interviewing, there, there were uh, sections where we were asking for their age, um, their marital status, um, and, and so on and so forth. Even how much were they earning currently? Um, how much were they earning currently? Perhaps that's not that of much of a big deal. But age, particularly marital status, what, why does that, what are we, you know, what's our business about someone's marital status? You know, and I tried to make a big deal about it and say, look, Mr. Adieu, this is how we do it here. You know, don't come and change things, you know. So I, I ended up um, going along with it, so to speak, although for me it was never an issue. But because that, that was a template of the, of the company, that was what we did. But for me, I think as Olu had indicated, there's certain reactions or certain statements or even certain questions that you may ask that may already be demonstrating a certain bias that you may have without you realizing it. So, for example, he said, uh, you know, a fellow, a colleague or a, an employee comes and says, oh, um, I'm expecting. And instead of saying congratulations, you say again, <laughs> you know, particularly if you're a superior, there's that dynamic. You say again, you know, it already sends a, a signal that, uh -huh. so, so for me, I'm going back to my experience uh, uh, a different climb. Um, I was fortunate I, I didn't ex experience, at least I don't think, but what I would say is that um, I was always very sensitive to looking out for those kinds of issues because oftentimes they're very subtle. And what I found was I was always, to a certain extent, uh, at least subconsciously, overcompensating or trying to compensate for the fact that one, I, my name sounds different from everybody else's name. You know, I'm black, I'm Nigerian, I have an accent, and here I am, I'm practicing law in a lily white environment, and I'm also practicing as a trial lawyer, as a litigator. So if I was even doing corporate work, I'd be in the office drafting documents, but now I have to be going to court sometimes trying to, um, sometimes arguing before judges and sometimes trying a case or trying cases before a jury. And psychologically, I'm thinking, I want these people to be focused on what I'm saying, not trying to figure out where I'm from. You know, my name is Shaney, Shaney, you know, Adio, those kinds of things. So there's so many things you're contending with besides just practicing, you know, but like, like I said, I have a good story to tell. I didn't really, um, although, and let me give an example. Let me give an example. Although, as a very young associate, very young associate, I was, in, I was in the litigation department, but I had to do an assignment for a partner in the employment, ironically, in the employment law section. <laughs> so I was, I was seconded to do this assignment, and I, and I wrote a memo, for, it was a research memo for the partner, very nice man. 
And he said to a senior associate, a black American, that, oh, Shaney, that, you know, he wrote a memo. He did a very good job. That is English his first language? <laughs> you know, I mean, now, the person that told me this um, didn't mean it. You know, he was sharing yeah. it with me. And I didn't take it. Now, again, I have to be careful. This is being recorded. Maybe the average, you know, uh, African American may have been offended by it and be upset and raised hell, but I didn't take it that way. I could have taken it as though, oh, gee, you know, I went through this process and that process was was thought to be obvious that, of course, you know, but it wasn't meant in that way. And I knew it was, I knew he was just being effusive in being, and maybe he ought not to have been pleasantly surprised, but. You know, there's, there are ways you can turn some of these things that may be considered negative to a positive. Because I also know that because I was different, at some point, I, I believe I got certain benefits and, and, and maybe even privileges that um, maybe some people didn't get because they found me interesting, unique. And I know I leveraged on that too, to be, to be honest, and to my benefit. So, um, so I think that's another thing that, you know, people should also think about that. I'll tell you another one. When I, when I, when I started my law firm, it was very difficult. And if I didn't have the passion for, for the law, so to speak, it would have been really, maybe even even impossible. I haven't recall some fairly senior lawyers to me saying to me, Shane, are you sure you want to do this? You've been away for so long, you know, very hard for you to reintegrate into the environment, particularly going on your own, and, and you don't want to be going into court and letting young lawyers slam you in the courtroom, and so on and so forth. You know? so, and the one saying that to discourage me, it was just saying, look, baby, are you sure you want to do this? And I said, yes, that's what I want to do. And for me, I said to the person that, look, one thing about me is that I'm not too proud to ask questions. So I'm not going to go in somewhere and make a fool of myself. I'm not sure I'll ask questions, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too proud to ask even the obvious. That's number one. So I'll mitigate those kind of incidences if they were to occur at all. And, um, and, and, that's, and, and that's what I did. I, you know, I started my firm. And one of the, th I would say is that I, again, subconsciously, the first few hires that I had were all female. And, you know, for me personally, I just felt that, you know, um, I don't, you know, I'm trying to, I don't want to be politically correct, but I'll just say this, that I found that, you know, my colleagues um, that are female, um, you treat them respect, you treat them well, you do their work, and it's about the work. And then, you know, uh, sometimes we, on the other side, the fellas, you know, there are too many things going on besides doing the work. So for me, you know, I had a bias towards, you know, and I mean bias in a positive way towards, you know, um, you know, the opposite gender, you know, and um, again, so I think that even as, as that's people, right sorry, there, huh? that's sorry, sorry, discrimination right there, sir. Please take note. <laughs> I just want to mention. You see that we guys we suffer. We see what we suffer. Okay. You know, but but so so I think that I think what I'm trying to say also for young lawyers and for people generally is that. Sometimes you have to look at what makes you unique and play to your strengths all the time in a, in a professional way, you know. Um, so, for example, the statistics that Osa gave about, you know, PLCs, directors being about 400 and something, where you only have about 20 something women as directors in PLCs. And I think um, in law firms, you have only a fraction as well as partners, whereas you have, you know, the majority, by far the majority being male, I think that only tells a fraction of the story because yeah. the fact of the matter is that if you look in, in most law firms, women tend to be more in terms of people coming into the firms. Mm -hmm. So if you have more women coming in and still, even though there are more women coming in, still only a minuscule amount of them are becoming partners, then there's something seriously wrong. There's something seriously wrong because you have a preponderance of women coming in, but as they, as they get more senior, they're not getting over the hump. It's a big problem. So I agree with uh, uh, Mr. Quarter that you know there has to be a, 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 a conscientious, deliberate, intentional, um, use the word philosophical way to address this issue. And a lot of firms are doing it 
particularly abroad, doing it successfully. Because I recall, for example, the, the lady that, I, that was the hiring partner when I was hired as a young associate, she ultimately became the section chair, you know, when I, when I was in the firm. And, um, you know, she was able to take as much time as she needed off when she was having children. Because the firm found her to be a utility person. She was very good at what she did. So the firm found every possible way to support her. And of course, when she passed that phase of her life of, you know, childbearing and what have you, she came back and continued to be that utility person, not just because she was an outstanding litigator, but she had all kinds of other attributes in terms of mentorship, mentoring young lawyers, um, and being a very balanced person, I'm sure at the partnership level, when that among the partners, issues may arise, you know? So, and those are some of the things that frankly, women also do sometimes, maybe a lot of times better than men. So for example, and I'll close by saying this, to show how, again, how, how female lawyers or female partners uh, can be a bit more discerning um, um, and empathetic, you know, all the, for the benefit of the business. So when I was coming through the ranks, about two years before my year became eligible to become for membership or partnership. So she said to me one day that, Shaney, you know, you've been working so much with this cluster of partners in the real estate and um, real estate and tax department. I was doing litigation, but I was doing the real estate litigation and tax litigation that, you know, I need to expose you to the corporate guys, you know, so that when, when your time comes up and I mention your name, people in the room can chime up and say, yes, I know him and, you know, excellent lawyer and what have you, that he needs that support and that you know, am I up for it? So really it was for me to rise or fall, but she was going to give me the opportunity to rise or fall. And I didn't seek that out from her that, that I wanted to get exposed to these other people on her own. She thought, if I'm going to be able to help this guy, he needs to help himself, but I need to expose him to the people who are the powerful people in the law firm, you know, the most powerful partners. If he goes in there and he does a tremendous job, then fine. If he falls on his face, then at least I've also given him the opportunity. I'm not sure that, um, you know, a, a, a male partner would necessarily, you know, have thought about that on his or on his volition, you know? So there are certain things that I felt that, you know, um, you know, uh, the opposite gender also bring to bear that, uh, you know, you can't, the invaluable qualities, let me just put, uh, put it that way. Um, that, um, you know, we should be conscious of. And, uh, you know, we used to tend to use the, the phrase a lot, enabling environment and what have you. But I think for the, for the enterprise, if we do more of promoting, you know, our women folk, I think ultimately the enterprise is going to be better off for it. So thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Jenny. And um, I, I think you, you raised a very, um, very, very important issue here. Um, I think part of this bias is, like you say, um, when we look at the statistics in terms of progression from associate to partnership and progression from executive management to board level for women, um, some of those biases could stem from what Ulimida Pata said about, oh, I'm pregnant, not again. And then this, this concept of the boys club, after work, guys going out to have a drink and um, you know, basically the boys club and, and all that. But, and that would just dovetail into my next question from Kim. And I'm, next, I'm sorry, um, we, we have this, um, we've identified the inequalities, traditional inequalities, historical inequalities. Um, and again, Jenny touched on it in terms of what some institutions do or governments do to bridge this gap. So my question is, what would you think would be the proper approach? Should it be positive discrimination or affirmative action? And perhaps maybe you just help define some of, explain these two concepts of affirmative action and positive discrimination. And what would you, would you think would be the best approach to balance out these uh, historical inequalities? Thank you, Osei. So I'm in the company of lawyers and I'll be very, very careful what I say about <laughs> affirmative action and positive discrimination. But let's just say, just for, for the purpose of contextualizing this, this conversation, that these are steps that organizations take, deliberate steps to address what have been observed as either gaps or areas of concern, in this case, in the body of the employee, okay, the, the workforce, 
Okay, and these gaps could be anything from uh, an inordinate or imbalance in the gender, so male, female. It could be um, education. It could be the fact that we have uh, certain uh, groups underrepresented. And what I mean by that is that, and this is a classic example, when I worked at the Treasury in the UK, where most of those in your policy making functions were actually people from your uh, Russell Group universities. So your Oxford, your Cambridge, and so on. Now, it wasn't because there were, you know, not, there weren't other people who were intelligent enough, but then our recruitment was literally just focusing on a certain pipeline. So essentially, the positive discrimination, affirmative action, uh, again, set of steps that organizations take to address specifically identified imbalances in their workforce. Now, how do we do this? And, and the first thing is, how do we even identify what these gaps are? Because a lot of the time, the challenge is in the data that we have and whether we're tweaking that data to say what it is we want to see and what it is we want to work on or whether that is the real issue. Look at what happened in South Africa, for example. Okay, and this was just after the apartheid era, just, you know, after the apartheid era and the view that if affirmative action was adopted, that it would help bring blacks into the workforce, it would help alleviate poverty, it would help, you know, get women in, into work and certainly reduce, you know, unemployment. But what that did essentially was that it then introduced chasms even within the black population because we're focusing on blacks in the city centers or in urban areas and what provisions do we have for blacks in rural areas for example we then had instances where even in the workplace people who were either unseasoned by virtue of experience were then being promoted to positions of significant responsibility. And of course, again, that had impact on organizations' performance and breaking up groups within the organization. So again, you had employee engagement issues. In the context of fairness, and especially looking at you know, women or disabled people, some of what I have seen, and I have to say again, a lot of the examples that I have in this area are from outside of Nigeria, not in Nigeria, because again, I haven't seen that, you know, uh, being used in my experience here. And what we have done literally was to understand the data, cut out the biases, talk to people. So it's not enough to run the reports, but you need to talk to people. And on the back of that, understand what or rather explain to people so they understand why we are taking certain steps but let me back up and say first of i think affirmative action positive discrimination it's all it's the same coin but a different side of the challenge that we're trying to deal with here which is unfairness i have heard it said and that would be my position that it is a different side of the same coin because what we're trying to do is to take deliberate steps to bridge certain gaps. But then what does that do to the other group or the other groups? How do they feel? What will they see this as? It's still discrimination. So I, I think that it is discrimination at the end of the day, but it's deliberate this time. It's intentional this time. And that's why I say it's the same coin, just a different side. And so I would suddenly agree that it is important that we address this issue, but I think it is how we go about it. And it is about having the conversations with the employee groups. And that's why I liked what Mr. Pata you know, said earlier. So it's not about you know, a few people, HR, for example, sitting in the room and saying, we're gonna do this, and then you start doing that the employees, the employee base has actually got to even recognize why this is a problem. Why if we have uh, certain groups, so all you know, able-bodied people, we're not considering disabled people, we have predominantly male you know, employees, we have predominantly a certain race or a certain ethnicity, 
what that would mean for us as you know uh, the reputation of our organization our ability to attract people our ability to have the organization perceived as a, a fair environment for people to come to work and progress in that organization because the options uh, or the opportunity rather is available. It's not a case of people like us, just men, you know, just evil body people, just Igbos or just Yorubas, you know, so there are positives to it, but it has got to be, the, the criteria has got to be clearly spelled out about what steps we're taking, why we're taking those steps, how long we're going to carry, carry out those particular actions for whether it is recruiting, targeting you know, a certain group, or whether it is actually even creating a pipeline of um, say interns, for example, from a certain demographic in the country, or whether it's a, a case of um, introducing uh, a program for women, young women, because, you know, as we say, at a certain stage of their lives, they tend to disappear, okay? But what can we do as an organization to encourage them to stay? What kind of policies can we put in place? You know, what kind of mentorship programs can we put in place from other women who've gone through that phase of life and have returned to work and have progressed? What do they do different? And how can these younger ones learn from their experiences but also again, have someone that they can talk to and know that look, someone has walked this path and if she did it, I can do it. And then that then helps them stay on at work and then hopefully progress, of course, again, where they're performing as they should. So I do think that it's a very challenging one um, and where it is not well managed, organizations actually pay a lot more um, in negative press, in disengagement, in actual, um, attrition, you know, when people leave, because as far as they're concerned, you know, you are practicing discrimination is just, you know, branded or packaged differently. Thank you very much, Neka. Um, and, and, and Jose, do you mind if I join in? Yes, for a, a minute, because we're actually running out of time. Yes, you can say okay. something for a minute, please. Yes, you may have gotten what you wished for, because um, it wasn't clear to me I thought it was clear initially, but then uh, towards the end, it wasn't clear to me. First of all, I really enjoyed listening to uh, Ineka. You know, she's, you know, she has it all nailed down. Um, but it wasn't clear to me when she said... Uh, uh, ...side, you know, okay. yes, but we're trying to pin her down. She's against it, or she just gave the argument on both sides because she was also onto something that I keyed into very, very quickly because it's something I've been through, not from a gender perspective, but from a race and color and creed and nationality perspective, mm. that for example, if a law firm con keeps going to Harvard and Yale, right? You will get some people of color, but, the, but the, you don't have a critical mass there. And so there's so many top law firms going to that same university. Mm. So you never get enough of them to, to get around the different major law firms in the US, for example. And there are many, many top schools, so, you know, and I'm not saying to compromise your standards, but also if what you do, for example, is to say, we're going to hire 50 associates this year, and we're going to recruit, you know, we're going to maybe go to Howard University, which is also a top university, but it's a black university, and there's nothing wrong with that. And you're going to recruit people who are in the top 5% of their class. You know, so good Marshall, for example, from our U.S. Uh, Supreme Court Justice, yeah. but from, went to Howard, Howard Law School. So then you, 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 that means you're making a conscious decision to make sure that you get a top yield of people of color. But if you keep going to the same um, uh, white shoe universities that for all kinds of reasons which you don't have time to get into, there's so many obstacles for people of uh, oh, a different get, shade yeah. to get into in the same numbers, then you keep getting the same results. So I don't know if you call that uh, positive discrimination or whatever. I, don't, I, I think that name even is not apt. I think it's, it's already prejudices what you're trying to do. It's, well, even affirmative action, people also sometimes roll their eyes about that. But again, what we tr you also try to do is not make people come into those environments and then they feel 
there's a token person in there and yeah. they didn't come in through the same rigorous standards. But there are ways you can address that. So I was, so I, was she, I thought she was saying absolutely no way for, for affirmative action, but then it appears she, she sort of, you know, um, um, by tweaking and, and sort of making the case as to how it can be done, maybe she's, she actually thinks it, it, it can be done but subject to all those criteria or the, or the guidelines that she, that she mentioned. Thank you. Yeah. Th thank you, um, um, Shani, for, um, for, for that interview. And, and therein lies the argument around affirmative action and positive discrimination. And, and I think it's, um, it's a conversation that has to continue. You know, and, and it's not something that um, um, we we'll speak for in a webinar session, and, and it's a conversation that needs to continue. So putting the structures in place, like Mr. Pata said, mentoring schemes, giving women opportunity to have um, developmental programs to put them in a position where they can apply for those positions actually is even part of the whole process. So anyway, just to go back to you, um, I, I'm sorry we lost you at that point, but to go back to you again, um, and this is something that, that, that really, I, I really wonder each time I say it, I look at newspapers and I see um, adverts asking for age qualification and you say you want 25 year old with 10 years experience, how is that going to happen? So what we're trying to do is create a culture of lies and people doctor their ages. And what, what do you think about that, Joe, from your point of view? Do you think there's a legal basis for that? Okay, well, so thanks. And apologies for earlier. I had some internet connection issues. It's funny, really, working from home. Um, just to balance, you know, to complete what I was saying earlier before I come to your question. You know, I was trying to say that there's some biases, you know, presumptions that women can thrive in certain roles or lawyers can do certain roles in-house and all that. And I was saying that there's a balance between someone's personal qualifications, personality and all that, helping the person get to what you may call fair treatment, and then also creating the enabling environment with um, Mr. Dio SN referred to as well. So um, I would say that, you know, if you had asked me this question generally on whether there's fair treatment generally, maybe two years ago, I probably would have said no, not for me personally, but generally. But I see that um, over a period of time, there's more consciousness. So where I work, I'm the secretary of the diversity and inclusion board, okay? Um, and so you see there's deliberate action towards diversity. Um, former place of employment, let me just mention that. I've been working from home for God knows how many months, even before the lockdown. And I'm still working from home. I haven't been to my office in months and it's going great, okay? Some people don't have that experience. Um, if I rewind back to when the Ebola crisis hit, I was in the law firm then. And um, those of us that were um, mothers with young children were allowed to work from home for almost three months, if I recall, at that time. Now, that's something that is not generally applicable to a lot of organizations. So I would say I've been privileged. And I think that um, the more we speak about these experiences, the more we motivate organizations to do these things. Because in the end, the fear of um, work won't get done or numbers will drop, those things are... Um, Presumptions, really. You, you, there, there are so many success stories where they've done the fair treatment, they've done good pay, good work hours, and all that, and the numbers are still good. Okay. So, to your question around age, um, honestly, I don't see any legal basis to say um, for this entry level position, it shouldn't be more than 30 years of age, it shouldn't be more than 40 years of age. I think it's ridiculous. I think it is very you know, um, unfounded, okay? But it's happening. But what, th what I thought about when you asked that question is, there are some that are upfront in their adverts to put the age. Some do not put it in the adverts, but internally there's already a decision that when the applications come in, if there's no date of birth in this CV, first of all, chuck it out. Or just use the years of experience to calculate. So you see, um, if there's a difference between, okay, organizations that are out there saying by this age, you know, don't apply or this number of experiences. Like you said, if you are 25, you should have had 10 years experience. Then you calculate when did the person graduate from the university and all that, you know. So it's, it's a big issue. There are more organizations doing it than we know because some don't even put it out there. There's a small select set of people in HR, NECA. <laughs> of course, I'm not referring to organizations. I'm just saying your HR colleagues would, you know, you would have an idea of this. 
Um, of course, they would consult in-house lawyers sometimes to know whether it's okay to do that, you know. So there's the subtle, you know, age is required thing. And I do not um, vet it at all. I don't think it's right, but it's the reality, okay? If you want to argue from the other side, someone will say to you, okay, it's an entry-level um, position. Entry-level means within one to three years of graduating, okay? If I throw it open to someone who is 45 years old, and you're saying that, are you saying that person just graduated at age 42 or 43, okay? And then if you talk about fair playing ground and all that, at the entry level, if I come in at an entry level and all my colleagues at the entry level are within the same age range, and then I see a group of three, four people who are like double my age, is it a fair work environment for me? In the sense that culturally, um, there's, there's, I'm supposed to defer to these people, okay? So we're working in a team, I have a project, and I'm putting a team with two people that um, are double my age, and you make me the team leader, I know the one, the same level. And then there's a cultural thing of uh, mind how you speak to this person, mind what you can delegate and all that. Then I can say I don't have a fair pay field. So does it justify organizations putting out age and all that? I don't think so. I just thought to bring that in as you know something to think about. So I don't, I don't really subscribe to that age thing. Do I subscribe to saying years of experience? I do because a job description will tell you who should be the right fit for a role. And I mean, NECA will confirm that in HR, when you're describing a job, when you're saying what is required, what the company needs at every point in time, you can't but help putting um, experience requirements. And of course, does experience, do experience requirements also connect to age? Sometimes, sometimes. If I say I want someone who is 15 years post-call, minimum of 15 years post-call, okay? For the legal profession, you have people that went to law school as grandfathers. So um, a 15-year-old will tell you, oh, I'm just two years post-call, but I believe I've had the experience working in um, a different role, not as a lawyer, to bring to the table, okay? So you, you have those arguments. I think that the discussion around fair treatment, age, experience, and all that is something that we can break it into different slices and you will never get um, you know, a one size fits all. So I will still repeat that I do not um, think that it's okay. I think it's actually illegal to put age, uh, an age cap in an advert. But the reality is that um, some have learned from reactions not to put the age cap in their adverts, but I know that when they're doing internal screening, and this is not a personal experience because I haven't had um, the opportunity to work in a place that's done age um, cap requirements, but I know that, um, you know, people do that internally. And, you know, there's also the one about the diversity thing. You know, you put an advert out there, you know that to meet your diversity um, agenda, you want a woman for the role, but you don't put it out there in the advert to say this role is for a woman. Some people do that. I've seen some adverts where they say this role is for a man or this role is for a woman, but some people don't bother putting it out there. But when it's screen, you, um, someone gets an email to say, oh, thank you for your interest in this organization. Unfortunately, your application has not scaled through to the next level. And you're not even sure why you're getting that email because you feel you have the qualifications but these are the realities really and um, i don't know whether there's one solution i think it's the conversations we have the policies we get companies to put in place and then people should speak up i think people that have these experiences don't tend to speak up someone and the person said you smell nice you smell nice became a hashtag because somebody wrote <laughs> about around someone who went for a job uh, interview and they said how old are you or how many children do you have or when next do you want to have a baby you know it, 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 it's it's the reality and i think the more conversations we have the closer we are to the ideal situation thank you Thank you, Chiwe, um, um, for, for that. Um, unfortunately, we are, we are really running out of time, so I'm just going to run through a couple of questions with Tony and um, Olu. 
Tony, um, this, this is for you. In your past life, you were the company secretary of um, Societe Boncoeur, and that was in the financial services sector. Um, there's this unwritten code in the financial services sector, as well in the banks, that when two people meet, date, and get married in the bank, one of them have to resign if they get married. Is this something you're familiar with and what would you have to say about it? Do you think is it all part of the fair work ad, um, agenda? Is it, is it part of the fair labor practice or is it a decent work policy? Uh, thank you. Um, well, on the question whether I'm familiar with it, personally, I'll say no. But um, <laughs> for me, I think the problem predominantly is this. It's in the question you asked. And you said it's because it's an unwritten rule. Anything that is not written or clear is subject to abuse. And, I, and, and that's always the problem. Um, worldwide, we know that that's a very touchy subject. Um, different organizations have different rules. Even, even in the most advanced clients um, about having romantic relationships in the office. I'm talking generally now. Now, the idea I think is that most of these institutions did not part and say what their rule was first. But generally, my take is this, is that if you're married already, in most instances before you come, there are instances where the married want to hire both of you. If both of you are going to bring value to that organization, it might not matter. But what is critical, one, is that first of all, have a policy on it. And that's what I always subscribe to. Uh, and then when you have two people in an organization who you think are advancing beyond the platonic relationship, the idea is that as much as possible, one, most organizations will not align if one is in a, in a position of authority over the other. We know for other reasons, including sexual harassment. So organizations frown at that generally. The problem with the banks at that time was that it was like a blanket ban. Rather than looking at the situation and creating um, solutions around them that will work for everyone, they would wake up and say, look, we would not have um, people in the same institution who are married. But I think the critical thing to look at, one, is one, is it going to affect um, the ability of that person to do their work in the organization and their relationships with others? Because what were some of the banks worried about? So one, that if, for example, a husband or a wife was in a position of authority, over the spouse. If you are going to talk of a promotion between the wife and somebody else for one particular position, one job offering, would, would there be the likelihood that you'll be biased and support your wife for reasons other than merit or your husband? Those are the reasons. But I think um, there are always uh, proactive ways to go around this. And that's why most institutions will say, let them work in different units or different departments. And you want a situation where one, is not in a direct supervisory role over the other. The banks at that time made it blanket, and that was really the challenge. Um, it's evolved today. I know some banks and other institutions today in Nigeria that have spouses actually working in the same institution, but holding different roles. But I think one, generally, um, I don't think it's a, it's, 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 it's a good rule to have a blanket provision simply saying, if you're married, you can't work here. But the idea is that even while, when you have it, you must ensure that you have an environment that ensures that there's equity, not only for the spouse, but for every other person in the organization. And that that relationship does not evolve from a position of where one party is in, has, an author, has authority over the other. So it's a delicate balance. Um, and we should not discriminate because people are married, but we should, we should, we should be proactive enough to structure an organization in a way that you can have married people work outside their emotions to each other, but in the interest of the organization for which both of them work. Thank you very much, Tony, for that, for that perspective. Um, I, I know we are running out of time. So, Olu, this is for you. Is Olu still with us? Is Olu just still with us? I'm not going anywhere else. So OK, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I think an integral part of the decent work agenda by virtue of um, Convention 185 and 151 of the ILO, it is a psychological well-being being an integral part of um, decent work agenda. Our last webinar was on mental health. And a lot 
of issues came to the fore. So my question to you is, do you think there's enough awareness about mental health and our bodies like the ACCA, MBA, CIP? Mental health and whether organizations are doing the needful. Yes. That for, I think that's for Lou. Yes, for yeah. me. Can you hear me? Yeah, we yes. can hear you very well. Now we can see you. Ah, excellent. Uh, I, I was thinking, I think I heard the meat of the question, which is, uh, are we doing enough? Uh, about mental health in the workplace or dealing with mental health issues in the workplace. I'm just waiting for us to unfreeze, but uh, <laughs> it's not happening. So let me proceed uh, on the basis of what we heard. Maybe if there's any more to it, you can uh, feel it when it comes back online. But obviously we are not, and it's a reflection of our society, you know, and the stigma that comes with mental health or the, or, uh, and um, and I think it's something that I have been, I have tried to champion, I continue to champion. I don't know if some of you who attended the SBL conference we organized in Lagos, I believe that was 2017, 20, I'm not so sure. The first one under my, yeah, during my tenure as chairman. And we had a fantastic session on mental health where we invited, uh, well, it, well, it was a health session, general health session, but there was the, as, the, the aspect of it that had to do with mental health and Dr. Memuna Kadiri uh, was one of the panelists. And, and you know, when, we, when, he was, when she had wrapped up, I made a comment and I said to everybody there that, that uh, Dr. Kadiri is my doctor and everybody, everybody began to give me funny looks like, uh, hope nothing, <laughs> hope, hope all is well. <laughs> you know? But I said, yeah, she's, she's a psychiatrist and she's my doctor because um, mental health, I, I, I began to understand recently how, you know, how dangerous a mismanagement of mental health issues can be. And we work, most of us work in pressure cooker environments. And, um, and um, there's no doubt that if we don't manage our circumstances properly, we can get affected. And, and um, so I was glad we had that session. I think it's important that we firstly destigmatize mental health in, in our society. And just as we are able to uh, handle and deal with uh, physiological issues, those that are more of a psychological nature, we should be able to handle without feeling any kind of way. Those reveal firm secrets. Yeah. So, um, um, and so, in, I mean, my brief rest, my, my very short answer will be, no, we're not doing enough. And, and I'm, I see the damage. I see the damage on a daily basis. People who are obviously suffering but cannot speak out as a result of the kind of society we belong to. And, and, and again, Forgive me for uh, back going back to the MBA uh, and uh, sounding political, but I think as part of welfare, you know, and as part of uh, uh, dealing with the welfare of our members, we must find a way to 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 allow uh, uh, to allow for these issues to come to the fore, uh, and you know, it's, it's actually quite dangerous if if we don't deal with uh, uh, allow uh, or ensure that our members, and, and you know, I speak generally now because honestly, it's not just about uh, 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 the legal profession. It is, it is, our, it is our society. You, we have all been witnesses to an upsurge in uh, uh, mental health issues because as society becomes tougher, as uh, our circumstances become uh, harsher, it, 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 it immediately it reflects on our mental health. And I think, we, we are, again, asking the MBA as an organization to lead the way. I think we should uh, take it upon ourselves to create a model that the rest of uh, society can look at and work with. And, and I, I personally, as part of uh, uh, my own uh, uh, personal CSR, I look out for those who are in need of uh, help in this regard. But as far as our profession is concerned, we must adopt a structured approach to dealing with mental health issues at the workplace. And 
lot of it comes a lot of it comes from uh, last one last point sure. a lot of it comes from actually the workplace itself has to be configured in such a manner that it takes into consideration or it, it is not inimical to the mental health of the worker you know and we, what we find is that a lot of workplaces uh, and, and the and the dominant players in those workplaces are actually the source of uh, of, uh, of mental health issues for their colleagues and for their subordinates. So we must take that as a as a part of the uh, housekeeping uh, going forward as a profession. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Akwata. Thank you so much. Um, I wish we could continue this conversation, but we have to leave. Um, so I just want to thank every single person who participated in the Business Day Legal Digital, Legal Business Digital Conversations. Um, these conversations were sparked by, you know, the global pandemic, COVID-19, and the new norm that we find ourselves in in the legal profession. And today's webinar has been part of a series with the NBA ELIR Committee on new paradigms in the employment um, relations. And I just want to thank our panelists, um, Mr. Sheni Adio Esenyan, Mrs. Nneka Idam, Mrs. Chimo Dibwebu, Mr. Ulu Akpata, Mr. Anthony Mochie, FBR, and our moderator, Mr. Oseo Beko, for this wonderful conversation. From the comment section, we can see that everybody, you know, learned something and felt that the contributions were necessary for where they are.